are examples of the uh, medieval art connected with the lives of the nobility um, not uh, uh, not something connected with the church we'll talk about it in a little moment so um, one is a fragment a surviving fragment of uh, uh, leopard embroidery from uh, around 1350 uh, so the art of embroidery the art of um, tapestry this really takes flight in the in the medieval period uh, here uh, we have a very popular motive of heraldic beasts all the noble houses had some sort of crests very often including exotic and fantastical and, and animals uh, such as unicorns or griffins or uh, like in this case the, uh, the leopards uh, very uh, similar animals are on the uh, on the um, coat of arms of uh, of um, the English king. Another thing is um, a little piece of jewelry. It's called Dunstable Swan Jewel from around 1400, and as you can see, it continues the great craft and skill of metal workers and uh, uh, animal workers uh, that you could observe in earlier times uh, this was a decorative object very likely used as a kind of pendant to be worn on a belt as you can see it's a beautiful um, animal beautiful swan uh, swans were also sometimes used in heraldry and uh, they by definition belonged to uh, to the king they could only be eaten at the royal table uh, the other thing that uh, i would like to show you is of course the uh, art connected with the church so we have the castles on one hand and the cathedrals and churches on the other and uh, of course the uh, the cathedrals in England after the Norman conquest follow all the styles and fashions in architecture and, uh, and decoration that are typical for Northern Europe. So uh, we have the Romanesque style, late Romanesque style, uh, then replaced by the Gothic style. And there are many wonderful, great surviving cathedrals um, in, uh, in England. Uh, some of them, uh, some of them uh, have uh, UNESCO status, um, Canterbury Cathedral, for example. Uh, Westminster, uh, Westminster Abbey as well, uh, York Cathedral, um, and uh, and uh, Durham Cathedral. These are all UNESCO sites, and uh, uh, the earliest of them, probably in terms of uh, the style, is probably the cathedral in Ely. Uh, in Cambridgeshire. This was actually situated uh, in the marshlands on something that looked like an island then but then kind of dried up later on. Uh, as you can see here in the in the illustration this is the tower of the cathedral from the 12th century. Uh, if you um, are familiar with the Romanesque and Gothic style you can actually see the transition here from the Romanesque style which is um, more solid and uses um, uh, uses uh, the, the arches, the kind of semicircular uh, arches to the Gothic style which is uh, lighter, more kind of pointy and has pointed arches and uh, um, this is uh, definitely the way to show the advancement in, uh, in architecture and engineering. Um, we have some more uh, examples here but you could generally um, go and, uh, and study the, the examples of beautiful cathedrals uh, throughout England. Each city with a bishop needed to have a cathedral so uh, they were built usually over long periods of time. It was uh, uh, usually uh, longer than, uh, than 100 years or more to finish. Uh, to complete 
complete uh, <clears throat> a cathedral, so it was a work for many generations. Uh, but um, but it's beautiful, and and most of them survived. And again, in the 19th century, there was a great wave of reappreciation, and many of them were um, were given some sort of renovation uh, before. Uh, before uh, now. So we have uh, some elements uh, like the very famous spire of Norwich Cathedral, this very pointy uh, top on the main tower and we have uh, some elements of the decoration of the cloister in Gloucester Cathedral. Um, Mostly uh, cathedrals uh, were connected to monasteries, so they would have all of the monastic elements like the chapter houses and uh, uh, living quarters and uh, eating halls, uh, uh, but also the cloisters, which would be covered areas for recreation, for walking and uh, meditation, uh, usually around a small garden. So they are very often uh, beautifully decorated. Um, so, um, yeah. So, um, it's not only the architecture, it's also the decorations of those uh, beautiful cathedrals and some of the artwork you can find inside. And of course the most uh, um, impressive and also influential in terms of the, of the later influence is the art of stained glass. So pieces of colored glass being arranged into beautiful mosaics. The kind of mosaics that uh, uh, would tell the stories of the Bible, of the lives of Jesus and then the lives of saints to the um, visitors, to the, to the faithful coming to the, uh, to the cathedral to pray. Uh, usually the, the vast majority of the society was illiterate, so what they needed to do was this kind of visual aids to help them visualize the stories uh, that were central to the, uh, to the religion. So we have uh, two examples from Canterbury Cathedral. Of course, we all know about the, the story of the murder of uh, Thomas Beckett. It's actually uh, represented in one of the, uh, in one of the um, stained glass windows. So we have the archbishop being attacked by the knights um, acting, we do not really know on the orders or just to please, uh, King Henry II. Uh, of course, uh, if it was on the order of the kings, this was the worst decision ever because the, uh, the archbishop was quickly canonized, the king had to do very public and humiliating penance, and Canterbury became a place of um, pilgrimage and uh, uh, was enriched tremendously uh, by, uh, by the popularity of uh, the saint and, uh, and the cathedral group. Um, we also have uh, uh, another uh, stained glass window from this, um, from this cathedral showing Jesus with his disciples on the, uh, on the boat. So this is a miraculous um, fishing which is, of course, very symbolic in its own right. Another thing that you can find in cathedrals and other churches are the tomb effigies. So the, um, the decorated graves of the um, rich uh, and influential people, very often uh, these would be local noblemen or knights. Uh, here we have um, one a uh, sculpted uh, tomb effigy from uh, the cathedral in Salisbury, another beautiful Gothic cathedral which we will meet again because it was a frequent subject for uh, John Constable in the 19th century. Uh, and uh, below that we have something which is uh, quite typical for medieval England, a type of tomb effigy which is a uh, uh, flat engraving on 
uh, on brass, so on metal. This metal, flat metal plates with uh, images of the people buried in the grave. Uh, it's quite popular now if you go to uh, to a historical church or cathedral in um, in Britain, then uh, you can take a piece of uh, paper and um, a piece of uh, of um, some sort of chalk or crayon and do something which is called brass rubbing. So you can uh, actually make a little image based on this uh, on this type of uh, effigies for yourself so we have uh, of course this is this is um, the evidence of the, of the deep faith of these people they believe that being buried in a church uh, increased the chances of um, salvation forgiving of their sins uh, but it also demonstrated their high social position and their well, uh, so we have the cathedrals here, lots of them, beautiful ones, but these are not the only churches that uh, are worthy of attention in the medieval period. And many beautiful Gothic churches are built, especially in the county of Suffolk. So the east of, um, of England, part of the historical kingdom of East Anglia. Uh, so, uh, for example, a beautiful little town of Lavenham, which was greatly enriched in the, uh, in the medieval period uh, because of sheep farming. We have the beginning of the great uh, popularity and um, prosperity of sheep farming in, uh, in Britain and those uh, sheep farming towns and villages usually um, enjoyed so much prosperity that they sponsored beautiful parish churches like the one in Lavenham uh, and also the, uh, the houses of the inhabitants are as you can see quite interesting uh, these are mostly um, half timbered houses so they are not made of stone they are made of this kind of wooden structure with uh, clay or brick uh, between the pieces of wood and uh, if you ever go to Suffolk it's wonderful to go uh, from one such uh, village or little town to another and to see the local churches uh, so here we have some examples uh, showing the inside of those churches um, some other churches in Suffolk one is the St. Peter's Church in Wenhaston um, in Suffolk and the other one is Holy Trinity Church in Blythburg um, and they show beautiful decorations uh, made from wood so wood carvings or paintings on wood like this uh, last judgment scene uh, from St. Peter's Church. This is a very frequently uh, used motive in churches, the last judgment, Christ coming in glory to judge the sins of the people who died. So we have the mass resurrection of everybody and then the last judgment after which the sinners will go to hell and the, uh, the um, worthy uh, will go to heaven. This was something again to remind the local population the importance of moral living, the importance of piety. Um, they took it very seriously. They really believed in uh, not only in um, let's say the the religious stories about Jesus, but about uh, but also in the devil, hell, and they were they were truly scared of the possibility of damnation, which they took very very seriously and literally. Um, another example from Holy Trinity Church is the um, uh, wood carving decorating the ceiling or the kind of roof structure, the visible roof structure, and we have those beautifully carved angels. So uh, as you can see, it's not only the domain of the very rich and uh, um, very likely there were uh, many more examples of beautiful uh, so sculpture or painting on
on wood, but they did not survive. We are lucky to have the, those that survived. Uh, the next thing is um, the uh, beautiful jewel reliquary casket, uh, which originally housed the bones of Thomas Beckett, so the main, uh, the main patron saint from uh, Canterbury. Uh, the uh, images on the casket, they are made uh, from precious metals and, uh, and uh, precious uh, stones. Uh, they look a little bit like those Saturn Who um, relics. So I would say that the craft did survive and it was still used. Um, just serving whoever was powerful later, in this case, of course, the church and the most, the most powerful cathedral in the country, the, the seat of the Archbishop of Canterbury, like the most important priest in, uh, in England. Um, the bones themselves did not survive. They were lost uh, during the Reformation period, uh, so we do not know what happened to them. Probably they were buried somewhere or lost. But the reliquary survives. If I remember correctly, it's also in the in the British uh, Museum, and uh, you can see the uh, the whole story of the martyrdom of uh, Thomas uh, Beckett on this uh, on this casket. It's not very large, but it's beautifully decorated in precious materials. Another thing that continues from this period is of course the books, the beautifully illuminated books and uh, these are mostly books with some sort of uh, religious um, meaning but not necessarily the Gospels or the Psalters that we encounter uh, earlier. We still have the Missals and, and the books of Psalms but uh, we also have something which becomes quite fashionable the book of hours like here the gray book of hours um, the grays were very family very powerful family who came with uh, with the norman invasion so they could commission such a precious object as a book to be made and this is a kind of calendar with all the months of the year and uh, the suggestions of what you should do in each month like for example in april uh, we have the zodiac sign of the taurus of the bull and we have people going on pilgrimage which is like taking literally from uh, from canterbury tales so it's april people long to go on pilgrimages this is what they do this is what they want to do uh, and uh, here we have um, the, uh, the little little illumination actually showing uh, a, an early version of uh, of canterbury tales with uh, uh, with chaucer himself on horseback as a pilgrim going to canterbury uh, what else we have in September? We have the zodiac sign of Libra, so the scales, and we have a man pressing the grapes for the uh, for the wine because that's what you do in September. Um, another uh, page from this book of ours, we have an initial, apparently a letter B, uh, with um, an illustration telling about one of the miracles of Saint Nicholas. He apparently brought back to life three boys who were murdered in some sort of gruesome crime. Uh, some more examples. We have, as I said, we have the, uh, the uh, church books like uh, the Evansham uh, Psalter, so the book of Psalms, the book of religious songs from the Bible. Uh, showing the uh, large image of the cru crucifixion of Christ and here we have another example the Sherborne Missal so the book for the priests for celebrating the Mass uh, with beautiful margins uh, and uh, uh, an initial illuminated initial and another full page uh, uh, illustration showing the crucifixion of Christ. Uh, some more things. 
we, we start having the first paintings. This is something that will um, encounter time and time again. We have the first king uh, who, who is portrayed, of whom we have the contemporary likeness. Not something taken from a book or something taken uh, or made long time after his death but during his lifetime and this king is a very young king one of the youngest kings to sit on the Brit uh, on the english throne king richard the second um so we have actually two portraits one is a kind of uh, portrait of uh, of young richard seated on the throne and the other one which is extremely interesting is a two-part thing it's called diptych diptych is a two-part painting uh, which was used as a kind of little book a book uh, that could be um, opened that could uh, serve very likely as a kind of private altarpiece or um, a, a little piece used for religious devotion so on one side of the diptych we have King Richard II, as you can see this young man uh, kneeling in front with three of his patron saints. And the one in the middle is Edward the Confessor. Remember the one who was buried, um, uh, whose burial was depicted on the Bayer tapestry. So here we have a younger king, many generations later, um, but still uh, still um, alluding to the patronage, to the importance uh, of, uh, of uh, Edward the Confessor. Um, another one is uh, St. John the Baptist and uh, the third one, if I remember correctly, is one of the Anglo-Saxon kings who was uh, canonized. If you're interested, check it and tell me. I would have to um, consult my notes um, to remember the name. It's one of those Ethel Stans or, or um, those Anglo-Saxon kings. So on the other side of the same diptych, we have uh, the Virgin Mary with baby Jesus and angels. And uh, we can see, it's like a whole scene. The young King Richard praying in front of Jesus and Mary with the help or with the intercession of his patron saints and uh, we have we have mary and the angels listening to his prayers probably very favorably you see uh jesus uh, blesses the young king with his hand and also we have some interesting details first of all we have this uh, red and white flag of St. George. This is the flag of England. So yes, these are the English angels. They are definitely the supporters of England. And also we have like the brooches, the decorations, as if attached to the robes of the angels. And they show a white deer or a white heart as this was known then and this is a heraldic symbol of Richard II of the king himself so it's like um, all the powers of heaven are absolutely on his side and they support him and we can assume that his prayers will be answered so absolutely this is what people believed if you were a king if you were a crowned monarch you were anointed uh, you were, uh, it was like a sacrament really, like an additional sacrament, the coronation with the anointment um, with uh, holy oil. Uh, the last three images, they show something very interesting and very beautiful and something that really starts in the late Middle Ages, that is the education institutions. So we have King's College in Cambridge one of the most beautiful colleges uh, and uh, we have the uh, college chapel from the outside as you can see from this this beautiful view from the river and inside with the famous beautiful absolutely beautiful sun vaulted ceiling so this like top 
notch of technology and art in uh, in architecture of the of the late Gothic period. So uh, fun vaulted ceiling. If you can see the close up, it like opens into this kind of fun like structure. It looks weightless. It looks uh, uh, very delicate and light. Uh, and of course, it's just a kind of illusion because it supports a very heavy, uh, a very heavy roof. Uh, another thing, the last thing here, is uh, a residential castle that starts to move away from the uh, necessity of, first of all, being defensive. We have larger windows. We have. Um, we still have a moat, so this kind of um, artificial island, artificial kind of water um, protection around the, the castle, but uh, it's really moving towards more comfort and practicality. We have the chimneys, so inside there was a heating system with fireplaces. Um, and we have something that is very new, very modern, and everybody wants it because it's a technological novelty. And this is a red brick. So red brick, it's not plastered over as you can see. Uh, this is the late 15th century. This is a new technology and uh, it's cheap and you can build um, quickly. You don't have to bother with those stone castles anymore. Uh, you can enjoy more comfort uh, in um, uh, in uh, uh, your living quarters. You can enjoy better heating or better lighting with those large windows. And everybody wants to have their palaces built of red brick. And this is what we will encounter next week when we talk about the Tudor period. And if you look at some of the Tudor palaces, and especially Hampton Court, you have red brick galore. So this is when it starts. And uh, yeah, thank you. That's it for this week.